My question is, how can we teach ethics? And I want to begin by asking you to imagine two year six students, Jack and Dewey, walking into a New South Wales ethics class together. You're close enough to overhear their conversation, which goes something like this. I heard something weird on the news this morning, Davey says. You know Barack Obama, the US president? Well, he lived in Indonesia when he was a kid, and you won't believe the stuff he ate. Roast grasshopper, and snakes, and wait for it, dog meat. That's so gross. So what, Jack says, people in other countries eat all sorts of things. And there are lots of places where people eat dog meat. But dogs are so cool, Davy says. They're smart, and it's just like wrong to do that to them. You might be surprised by this conversation. After all, these kids are still in primary school. But it's virtually a mantra in child psychology that we underestimate the, the competence of the young child. Children of that age do listen to the news. They do show an interest in ethical and political issues. And research shows clearly that with the right kind of support, they're ready to engage in this kind of reasoning. They're capable of managing the logic, despite what Piaget had to say about that. And from at least the age of four, they're capable of distinguishing ethical issues from other kinds of issues, and to be able to reason about them. When Davy says it's like, and here she's searching for the appropriate term, wrong to do that to them, she indicates that she understands that she is making a moral judgment. I'll be using the two terms, ethical and moral, interchangeably uh, today. An action or social practice forms within the ethical realm if it affects the interests and well-being of others. And when we make an ethical judgment, we judge an action or practice to be right or wrong, good or bad, or fair or unfair. Dewey is judging the practice of killing dogs as morally wrong, and she's providing a reason to back up her judgment. <coughs> Namely, that dogs are intelligent. In other words, she's putting forward an argument. And now Hannah joins in with a response. Well, Hannah says, I bet pigs and cows are she and sheep are smart too, and we eat them. And Jack butts in, there are tons of people in India who think it's wrong to eat cows. And what about Shreyas? Where he comes from, they think it's wrong to eat any kind of meat. Sure, Hannah says, and he doesn't go around bagging us for eating lamb and stuff. He follows his customs and we follow ours. Hannah is pointing to a logical consequence of Davy's argument, one that Davy herself has missed. If it's wrong to kill dogs because they're intelligent, then it's wrong to kill any intelligent creature for food, including those that end up on Davy's plate. And Jack is pointing to the fact of moral difference, the fact that different cultural groups have different moral rules about killing animals for food. And of course, Hannah goes on to allude to the virtue of tolerance. Shreyas doesn't criticise his friends' eating practices, even though he believes them to be morally wrong. Although some of the moral rules his friends live by differ from his, he's still able to live in harmony with them. But back to the kids' discussion. Yeah, it's true that Shreyas doesn't go on at us, says Dewey, sounding annoyed, but we don't eat dogs. I still think that's gross. It's just wrong. Look, Jack says, what's wrong is criticising the way other people live. Jack's right, says Hannah. We can learn stuff from other cultures, and we should respect all different ways of doing things. It's the only way to get on together. 
Okay, Davey says, you're right about one thing. Finding out about other customs can help us think about our own. If pigs and cows are as smart as dogs, then I'm with Shreyas. I reckon it's wrong to eat them. But I still think it's wrong to eat dogs, even if some people think it's right, and I think it's important to say so. Let's zoom out from the dialogue yet again to the heart of the disagreement between Davy and her friends. Jack and Hannah take the view that different cultures have different customs and different moral values, and that when we judge the way other people live, we are using our values, our standards of right and wrong. But then, what grounds do we have to think that our standards are better than those of any other culture? Is there a culture independent or objective yardstick we can use to judge between different moral standards? Jack and Hannah believe the answer is no. On their view, all we have are the moral codes of different societies. In other words, morality is relative to culture. This is the view known as cultural relativism. Dewey, on the other hand, thinks there must be a culture-independent yardstick, an objective standard on which to base her claim that eating dogs is wrong. Without, without articulating it, she seems to be thinking of moral claims as akin to scientific ones. The scientists supports her statement say that smoking is harmful by pointing to independent factual, ev independent factual evidence about the effect of tobacco on lungs and blood vessels. Davy expresses a strong intuition that there is an equally independent body of evidence against which moral claims can be judged, although she offers no idea about where that standard might be found. The debate between Davy and her friends gets to the, at the most important issue confronting any attempt to teach ethics. Our society, like many others, is multicultural, encompassing many different social practices. Different food practices, different family systems, and so on. And the society is undoubtedly the richer for it. All three friends, friends agree we can learn a lot from the ways other people do things. And if Jack and Hannah are right, then teaching ethics should amount to encouraging students to be tolerant of moral views that differ from their own and to refrain from moral judgment. On the other hand, if Dewey is right, and there are objective cultural independent standards on which to base moral judgments, then teaching ethics should involve helping students to discover these standards and to employ them judiciously. How can we teach ethics? Clearly, before we can answer this question, we need to address the issue of whether there is a culturally independent moral yardstick. I'm gonna take a shortcut here. I'll address this issue using the method I consider best suited to the teaching of ethics. In doing so, I'll be able to illustrate and explain my answer to the question, how should we teach ethics? So let's suppose I am Dewey and Friends' ethics teacher, and that having overheard their conversation, I decide to spend the next few lessons helping them get to grips with ethical relativism. Where do I begin? That's not too hard. I'm gonna start with the idea on which moral relativism rests, the idea of moral difference. And I'm going to introduce some examples to encourage students to consider whether these moral differences are quite what they seem. So I'd like you to imagine you're the class, and I'd like you to try and answer in your heads the questions I throw out. I'm gonna begin with something Jack has to say. There are tons of people in India who say it's wrong to eat cow. Why, why don't they eat cow? What reason do they have? I don't want you to try and answer this question right away. First, let's think for a minute about the reasons we have for doing things. For example, and in the classroom I would use many examples, this is just one. Presumably most people here have decided not to take up smoking. Why? What is your reason? No doubt, it's your belief that smoking will give you lung cancer. 
Now let's think about the reasons people in other cultures have, might have had for doing things, different other cultures and other times. The ancient Egyptians mummified their dead. Why? What was their reason? Again, a belief. The belief that humans had souls which at death left the body only to return after burial. But in order to return to its body, the soul had to be able to recognise that body. Hence the mummification. Now, let's come back to the present. Why do some people in India think it's wrong to eat cows? What reason do they have? Again, the reason lies in their beliefs. In particular, their belief that the souls of people who've died can occupy the bodies of cows, so that a cow might well be a person, and their belief that it's wrong to eat people. And what do we think? Do we agree with them about the last bit, that it's wrong to eat people? Well, yes, we do. Are their moral values different from ours? They are not. The difference is in our factual and spiritual beliefs. We agree that we shouldn't eat people. What we disagree about is whether cows might be people in disguise. This, this exercise helps us to see that sometimes what seems like a difference in moral codes is really a difference in factual or spiritual beliefs. And there's, here's another case in which we need to look at apparent moral conflicts very carefully. I need to ask you to switch your minds to traditional Inuit societies. We're going to think about some of their moral rules and compare them with our own. Here we need some background knowledge. Now this is an aside. Background knowledge is enormously important. One of the big breakthroughs in understanding developments in children's thinking came with the recognition that children can only engage in higher order thinking about a topic if they have an appropriate knowledge base. Where they lack such knowledge, children display the limited thinking that Piaget described as pre-operational. But the moment the knowledge base has sufficient information, these limitations vanish. So, quickly, some background information on the Inuit. I'd be giving kids a whole lot more, of course. In their icy environment, the Inuit lived in family groups which came together in winter when food was scarce. They had strict rules about lying, stealing, sharing and so on, and making fun of people. Penalties were laid down for breaking these rules and the most serious penalty was expulsion from the group. This was a harsh consequence because it was hard to survive on the outside. And here's something interesting about the way the Inuit dealt with those who broke the rules. Surprisingly to us, if the best hunter in the group is found guilty of stealing, which is one of the most heinous offences, he will be given a lesser punishment, about half as severe as the punishment which would be meted out to a less skillful hunter. Is this the way our rules work? Let's look at a school example. Suppose Jack is the best cricket player in the school team. The team has made the grand final and it's the last practice session before the match. The coach has a no put down rule and he's very strict about it. No one is allowed to make fun of another player. Anyone who does is dropped from the team for the next match. During practice, one of the kids, Tan, fumbles what should have been a very easy catch and Jack makes fun of him. The coach notices and said, says, you know the rules, Jack. I'm afraid you won't be playing in the grand final. Jack is the best player in the team and it's the grand final. Should the coach have let him play, even though he'd broken the rule? As an aside, this is an exercise designed for year four students, but if I were to take your responses, I reckon they'd match the, the year fours pretty well. Um, some, some of the kids will argue that as a matter of fairness, the same rules and consequences should apply to everyone. Others might suggest that the coach should allow Jack to play uh, and perhaps miss a match next season. And why? Well, for the good of the team. It's in the team's best interest to win the grand final. Other kids might disagree, arguing that the good of the team will be served by standing Jack down. If Jack gets away with it, other kids will copy him and teamwork will break down. Now let's think, let's think about the Inuit again. Why did they give a less severe punishment to the leader of the hunt? What was their reason? 
clearly they did it because the survival of the group depended upon keeping the best hunter within its fold. They did it for the good of the group. Zooming out again, these questions encourage students to consider the idea that the moral rules of a society are not simply a reflection of the society's moral values, but also the result of the physical circumstances in which they live, as well as their beliefs, as we've seen. The Inuit rules and penalties are designed to ensure the good of the whole community, just as the cricket team's rules are. It's not that the Inuit's moral values are different. Rather, their harsh circumstances force them to make choices we don't have to make. What appears to be a moral difference boils down to something else, this time a difference in circumstances. But this is not to say there aren't some real and serious clashes between the moral codes of different societies. With adults, we can talk about female circumcision, or the Nazis' treatment of the Jewish people, and so on. With children, we can talk about bullying. In the classroom, I would spend quite some time on the question of what bullying is, using examples such as, is it bullying when your parents insist that you go to bed at 8.30 when you want to stay up? Uh, is it bullying if you accidentally knock someone over when you're running back from lunch, and so on. Here we're not giving students an abstract definition at the beginning. Instead, we're working with their intuitive notion of bullying and asking them to formulate criteria um, that distinguish bullying from other practices. This is an important logical skill. The criteria they will come up with uh, will include some of the following. Um, the behavior is deliberate, it's repeated, it's designed to hurt the victim physically or mentally, and the victim feels like there's nothing he or she can do about it. Now we need to ask an important question. Is bullying wrong? Of course, in a classroom, no one is gonna say no. So I can go on. Okay, if it's wrong, what makes it wrong? From now on, I'm leaving the classroom materials and going very quickly. <laughs> and I'm gonna present an argument to you as an adult audience, but this is not the way I would do it in the classroom. What makes bullying wrong? The answer is going to be the harm it causes. But now let's suppose we find a society in which a powerful group of people, perhaps the government, bullies anyone in the society who criticizes what it does. And when we ask the rulers why they do it, they answer, it makes us feel important. It makes everyone else too scared to stand up to us so we can do what we like. Let's suppose that the bullying causes just as much harm to its victims as bullying does in our own, in our own schools and society more generally. Are the members of the government wrong to bully their people? I suggest we feel very strongly here that the answer is yes. But now suppose that a member of this government accuses us of using our own moral standards to ju judge his country's moral code. How arrogant, he says. What reason do you have for thinking that your stand on bullying is morally better than, my, than that of my country? Do we have an answer to this question? If we do not, we cannot condemn practices such as the selling of children into slavery or racism or stoning people to death for adultery. We must ask ourselves why we feel confident that ethical judgment is necessary in these cases. The answer surely lies in the significant harm, the suffering these practices bring. The harm caused is an objective fact, as objective as the evidence that smoking causes lung cancer. Here we find a form of culture independence, uh, independent evidence on which to base ethical judgments. Human beings share common capacities for both suffering and well-being. But this is only half the story. As humans, we do not act simply out of instinct or habit. We often act on the basis of reason as well. We can state these reasons as day we did, and we can evaluate our reasoning processes using the rules of logic, as Hannah demonstrated. Once we recognize common capacities for suffering and well-being, reason demands that we give equal consideration to the interests of all those affected by our actions. If ethics is grounded in both reason and common capacities for suffering and well-being, 
then we have, an independent, we have independent evidence on which to base moral judgments. We can ask whether a social practice demonstrates equal consideration for the interests of those affected by it and whether it promotes or retards their well-being. On this basis, we can reject relativism and stand up against injustice and more particularly, bullying. And we can teach children to do so. By engaging them in the sort of ethical inquiry I hope we've all, we've all been engaged in in the last 20 minutes. By supporting children to discover for themselves the foundations of moral reasoning and how to apply these fundamental moral standards in the consideration of the complex issues they will face in their lives. And in the process, we can help them strengthen their logical and moral reasoning skills. All this research shows is best done in collaboration with peers in the context of what we might call, after Matthew Lippmann, a community of inquiry. And I think that's pretty much the topic of our next speaker. Thank you.